Greetings. I'm the man behind the mask, and I would like to pose you a question. Can you name me the only city that won every major sports title of the time in the same sporting year? Well, if you said New York, you'd be wrong. If you said Boston or Chicago, you'd again be wrong. The only city to ever accomplish this feat is none other than Detroit. That's right, in the 1935-36 sporting year, Detroit would be home to the champions of Major League Baseball, the NHL, and yes, even the NFL. What about the NBA, you ask? Well, the precursor to the NBA, the Basketball Association of America, wouldn't be founded until June 6, 1946, so basketball was not one of the major sports at the time. Now, during the 1930s, the U.S. was sunk in the Great Depression. Yet, in the midst of all these troubling times, Detroit was able to find something to celebrate about. It all started when a young boxer named Joe Lewis, who had recently turned professional, began his rampage through the physical and racial barriers in 1935. Though he would not win the title during this year, his story is still vital to this Detroit tale as it was his success that would first get the Detroit sports fans excited and serve as motivation for the other Detroit teams and athletes to follow in his wake. His 24 knockouts in this year would raise him up from being an unknown fighter, but it would be his brutal beatings of two of boxing's finest fighters that propelled him to being universally regarded as the uncrowned champion of the world. The first of his two big bouts came on June 25, 1935, in Yankee Stadium, New York, against Primo Carnera, an Italian-born giant of a man who fought under the nickname the Ambling Alp. However, as it turned out, Carnera was just too slow to defend against Lewis, which resulted in him taking a fearful battering that ended when he was knocked out 2 minutes and 32 seconds into the sixth round. The second big bout came on September 24th in New York against the iron-chinned Max Bayer, a fighter who had been the world heavyweight champion from June 1934 until he lost the title by decision to James Braddock in June of 1935. Nicknamed the Livermore Larper, Bayer came into the fight with 40 wins under his belt, 27 of which came by the way of knockout. Going into the match, Bayer had lost fights before, but had never been knocked down. However, that fact changed in this fight. Before the fight was a minute old, Lewis had cut Bayer's face, and come the third round had knocked him to the canvas twice. After taking a hard left hook to the jaw in the fourth round, Bayer backed away from Lewis, and when he was over by the ropes, he went down on one knee and stayed there until the referee counted him out, giving Lewis the win by knockout. This fight would be the most important of the year for Lewis, and would come to be viewed as one of the greatest of his career. On the heels of Lewis's success, the Detroit Tigers baseball team would be the next to prove their worth. Entering the 1935 season in defense of the American League crown, the Tigers had good reason to be optimistic, since they had come only one win away from winning the World Series against the St. Louis Cardinals the previous year. However, despite the early optimism, the Tigers started out slowly. So much so that they had dropped to last place in April and were still in sixth place by the end of May. But the Tigers began to regroup and quickly climbed back up in the standings thanks to the outstanding performance of their players, such as the G-Men of Detroit, Hank Greenberg and Charlie Gehringer, as well as Mickey Conkren, Leon Goose Goslin, Linwood Schoolboy Rowe, and Tommy Bridges. By mid-July, the Tigers had taken over first place from the Yankees, before ultimately winning the American League pennant by a margin of three games, automatically qualifying them to play in the World Series, since the playoff system for Major League Baseball would not be initiated until 1969. In the World Series, their opponent would be the National League champion Chicago Cubs, who had beaten Detroit in two previous World Series appearances in 1907 and 1908. The first game of the series at Navin Field ended in a 3-0 win for the Cubs, but the Tigers would go on to take the next three games in a row, which included a 6-5 win in the 11th inning of Game 3, to give themselves a commanding 3-1 lead in the series. 
However, the Cubs would stave off defeat when they won Game 5 at Wrigley Field by a score of 3-1. Back in Detroit for Game 6, the Tigers and Cubs would fight harder than in any previous game thus far in the series. The game would be a back-and-forth contest with both teams combining for 24 hits. Though despite all of the hits, it was a fairly low-scoring game. With the teams deadlocked at three going into the ninth inning, the Cubs' third baseman, Stan Hack, hit a leadoff triple, putting the winning run in position. However, Tigers pitcher Tommy Bridges came through with a strikeout and a throw to first from a weak grounder hit back to the mound before Goose Goslin caught a pop fly to left field for the third out. Goslin was the fourth in the Tigers' order for the ninth inning, and by the time he came up to bat, Detroit had Mickey Conkren on second base for the winning run and two outs against them. Goslin would then lace a base hit over the head of Chicago's second baseman, giving Conkren enough time to speed home to win the game 4-3 to in favor of the Tigers and give them their club's first ever World Series pennant. In the midst of the Tigers' World Series triumph, the Detroit Lions football team would keep things rolling. Much like the Tigers, the Lions had come very close to championship glory in 1934 and thus entered the 1935 season full of optimism. The Lions would open up their season with a 35-0 thrashing of the Philadelphia Eagles on September 20th. However, this season would prove to be much more competitive than the last. By mid-season, it was turning out to be a brutal stretch of games for all of the teams in the Western Division, as no clear dominant team emerged. The Lions themselves ended their eighth game of the year with a 31-7 loss to Green Bay, which dropped them to last place with only four games remaining in the season. But they would respond by beating the Packers 20-10 in their rematch, then tying the Chicago Bears 10-10 before beating that same Chicago team 14-2 on Thanksgiving Day to keep their championship hopes alive. Going into the final game of the season, the Lions not only needed to beat the Brooklyn Dodgers, but also hoped that the Bears could beat their crosstown rival, the Chicago Cardinals. The Lions would uphold their end with a 28-0 victory, and luckily the Bears were able to do them one favor and beat the Cardinals 13-0, giving the Lions the Western Division crown. With the division winners decided, the NFL championship game was set to commence on December 15, 1935 at the University of Detroit Stadium between the Lions and the New York Giants, who would easily cruise to a second consecutive Eastern Division title and were looking for their second consecutive NFL championship as well. Though the Giants boasted one of the best passing offenses in the game to go along with a tough defense that had tied the Packers for giving up the fewest points, it was the Lions who would demonstrate offensive and defensive prowess on this day. The rain and sleet would also play a major factor, as the weather got worse as the game progressed, greatly diminishing the passing attacks of both teams. In fact, the Lions only completed two passes the whole game but they came when they were needed most. Both passes would combine as part of a 61-yard opening scoring drive that ended in a touchdown and put the Lions up 7-0. After stopping the Giants' following drive with an interception, the Lions capped off their second offensive drive with another touchdown for a 13-0 lead. Though the Giants would regroup in the second quarter with a 42-yard touchdown pass to cut Detroit's lead to 13-7, it would prove to be the only points that the New Yorkers could manage to score. In the second half, the Lions would add another two touchdowns to their score and shut down any offensive attempts by the Giants to seal the Lions' first ever NFL championship and claim the Ed Thorpe Memorial Trophy by a final score of 26-7. A few months later, the Detroit Red Wings hockey team finished their regular season at the top of the American Division and the NHL and look to keep the Detroit sports trend going as they enter the playoffs against the Canadian division and defending Stanley Cup champion, the Montreal Maroons. Though the Maroons had not lost a game in over a month and were heavily favored to win the Cup once again, the Red Wings proved that they were not one to be taken lightly. The first game of this best-of-five series would remain tied at zero by the time the third period ended, 
sending the game into overtime. But one overtime led to another and then another as the Wings' Norm Smith and the Maroons' Lauren Chabot refused to allow anything to get past them. This would last until there were three and a half minutes left in the sixth overtime period, when the Detroit rookie Mud Brunto finally slid one past Chabot to end the longest game in NHL history to this day in favor of the Red Wings, one to nothing. Norm Smith would continue his shutout streak into Game 2 as the Wings blanked the Maroons 3 to nothing. But in Game 3, the Maroons would finally score a goal to give them a 1 to nothing lead. However, shortly after Montreal's goal, Detroit would answer with two of their own. And with Norm Smith once again acting as the roadblock to the Maroons' offensive efforts, the game ended with a 2 to 1 score and a clean three game sweep for the Red Wings. Moving on to the Stanley Cup Finals, the Wings faced the second-ranked team from the Canadian division, the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Red Wings would win the first two games of the best-of-five series in Detroit by the scores of 3-1 and 9-4, before they headed to Toronto looking to close out the series in Game 3. Up 3-0 midway through the third period, it looked like the Red Wings would sweep yet another team. However, Toronto would tally three quick goals to send the game into overtime, where 30 seconds in, Toronto's Buzz Bowl scored the game winner and forced a game four. Riding their momentum into the fourth game, Toronto's Joe Primo scored late in the first period to give the Leafs a one-goal lead. Detroit, however, responded in kind to tie the game. Then mere moments later tallied another goal for a two-to-one lead. Playing with an intensity that matched the importance of the game, the Red Wings continued their attack into the third period and were rewarded with a goal from Pete Kelly to give them a two-goal lead. However, that lead would be cut down to one, not more than a minute later. From that point on, the Red Wings threw up their best defensive play to quell the frantically attacking Leafs, until the horn finally sounded the end of the game and signaled the Red Wings' first ever Stanley Cup championship. With the Tigers, Lions, and Red Wings all earning their first championships, Detroit had succeeded in winning all three of the major sporting titles. But the city's success did not stop there. Aside from also boasting the biggest fighter in the boxing world, champions from various other circles in sports this year hailed from Detroit. The IHL champion Detroit Olympics, the captain of the Ryder Cup winning U.S. team Walter Hagen, the world speedboat record holder Gar Wood, and the world professional sprinting champion Eddie the Midnight Express Tolan were just a few of the other championship athletes and teams from the Motor City. This period of dominance remains unsurpassed in the annals of American professional sports, and no other city has since won three major professional sports championships in the same sporting season, thus making Detroit the one and only City of Champions.